Rivellino was an incredibly skillful player. Everything about him was good. He was skillful. He had a great shot on him. He positioned himself well and had a nice touch. He couldn't give him any space, or he'd shoot, and he had such a ferocious shot. Rivellino, just like every player who played in that 70 team, was a legend. Undoubtedly one of the greatest midfielders Brazil has ever had. Sao Paulo, a vast, sprawling metropolis, home to an estimated 20 million inhabitants, the largest city in South America and Brazil's economic capital. Amidst the traffic and the daily hustle and bustle, Sao Paulo lives and breathes the national game too, football. The city is also home to one of the greatest players to pull on the legendary yellow shirt of Brazil. Roberto Rivellino, a skillful left winger in perhaps the greatest national team ever to have played the game. I came to live here when I was very little, so I grew up around here in Brooklyn, here where I've got my school, or well, just over there, there used to be a pitch where we all played, and at the Morumbi too, there were a few pitches we played on, oh, there used to be so many places we'd have a kick about. Son of Italian immigrants, the young Roberto played his football here on the streets near Sao Paulo's Morumbi Stadium. It was here that he learnt the tricks, the dribbles and the feints that he would later become famous for. Football's in my blood. Back then there was the problem that you didn't have a ball to play with all the time. But I used to play barefoot on the streets. My feet ended up becoming very tough. I'd scuff my toes, I'd cut my feet, bandage them up with a cloth and carry on playing. Rivellino was fortunate enough to grow up in Brazilian football's golden era. As he enjoyed his kickabouts in Sao Paulo's back streets, Brazil won back-to-back -back World Cups in 1958 and 1962. Players like Garincha and Pelé were idolised by Rivellino's generation. We loved to play, but that was one thing. It was something else to think, I'll turn professional or try my luck at a club. It wasn't like that then. It was different. But we enjoyed following the national team, especially in 62. It was only later on video that you could see what they could do, see a player like Garincha and the incredible things he did. For me, no one's been able to do what he could do in his era of the pitch since. His talent was apparent to anyone who saw him play. In 1965, he got his chance to emulate his heroes here at the Pakeembu Stadium, playing for Sao Paulo's most popular club, Corinthians. He settled in instantly. Rivellino was already a great player from the age of 17. When I arrived at Corinthians, I was the Prince of Portuguesa, and he was the little king of the park. He was a great player. Right from a young age, he was top class. I played a few times against Rivellino. He played for Corinthians, and I played for Santos. And he was an incredibly skillful player. Rivellino was the type of player who you had to really watch carefully during a game. Firstly, because of his technique. Secondly, because of his vision. And thirdly, you couldn't give him any space or he'd shoot and he had that ferocious shot. He really dominated the midfield. The Corinthian fans loved him. They called him the kid from the park or the little king. I remember when we played Corinthians, we'd really have to be on our guard and mark him tightly. 
Rivellino was an exceptional player. Those quick feet and his explosive shooting soon brought him to the attention of national team selectors. As Brazil prepared to defend their World Cup title in 1966, Rivellino just missed out on a spot in the squad. He was happy to wait for his moment in the spotlight, however. It wasn't disappointing, especially as things happened very quickly in my career. In 63, I went to Corinthians. In 64, I was training with the pros. And by 65, I was in the first team. In 66, I could have been called up to the national team. But it was better for me to wait until 70. Indeed, four years later, the Corinthians playmaker had forced his way into the Brazilian squad. Brazil had failed dismally in 66, and their preparations for the 1970 World Cup in Mexico were meticulous. But Rivellino was still not yet a first-teamer in manager João Saldanha's eyes. Saldanha had his own style of management. In the qualifiers in 69, he said, this is my team. Players will only get dropped if they play really badly or get injured. So I think I only played in one of the qualifiers against Colombia where I even scored, but I only played half an hour. Nevertheless, Brazil enjoyed unprecedented success under Saldanha, becoming the first nation to qualify for a World Cup, winning all of their games. For Rivellino, prospects of involvement looked bleak, especially as he was vying for a place with the world's most celebrated player. The funny thing was that when we were training for the World Cup, several journalists were saying that Rivellino shouldn't be playing for Brazil because at Corinthians he played in the same position as me. And while the atmosphere inside the camp appeared relaxed, cracks were beginning to appear between manager and the Brazilian FA. Just months before the World Cup began, Saldanha was sacked. He wanted control of team selection. So, he had some issues with Federation President Juan Havelange. Havelange then sacked Saldanha, so behind the scenes it was a little tense. In my opinion, Joao Saldanha's great error came when he received some heavy criticism from Flamengo's coach, Eustrich, who is no longer with us today. He then went after him with a gun, trying to shoot him. That was his great error, as obviously doing that had some very negative repercussions. Saldana's replacement was Mario Zagallo, veteran of the 58 and 62 World Cup triumphs. His appointment proved to be the turning point in Rivellino's international career. I made various changes. I put Piazza at the back, and he was normally a midfielder. Claudio Aldo and Rivellino were on the bench, but I put both of them in the first team. When Zagallo came in, I still didn't expect anything. I played under him, but I never thought I'd play out on the left wing either. Rivellino is very intelligent. He was unbelievably skillful, especially with his left foot. He scored free kicks, he was a great passer. So they tried him out playing on the left wing, and that's when that Brazil side became complete. Zagallo may have restored order to a talented squad, but optimism back home was low. The partying may have got underway in Mexico, but few expected big things from Brazil. We left Brazil with no one believing in us. And then in our group, we were up against England, the holders, Czechoslovakia, who'd become European champions, and Romania, the new European sensations. No one believed in us. We left the country with everyone thinking Brazil wouldn't get through their group. Those doubts seemed justified as Czechoslovakia took an early lead in Brazil's opening game of the tournament. That first game was so important for us. We were 1-0 down after a goal from Petras, but then I was lucky enough to equalise from a free kick. And then, well, Brazil played beautifully and we won 4-1. It was great. To play our first game at that level gave us so much confidence. Having been out-muscled in 1966, Brazil had spent months preparing their players. They now knew they had both the physical and technical potential to win the World Cup.
It was at the end of that game that we saw that everything we'd gone through, everything we'd worked for, and it was three months of hard work, was beginning to give results. Next up were the holders, England, the key game for Brazil and their chances of success. Win and they would top their group, staying in Guadalajara and avoid playing at altitude until the final in Mexico City. Lose and they would have to face the feared West Germans. It was our toughest game in that World Cup. It could have been 1-1 or England could have even beaten us 2-1 or 1-0. But it was Brazil who triumphed by a single goal. We won 1-0, but it was a game that could have been the World Cup final. Once we'd beaten England and qualified for the next round, then morale was really high. Rivellino too was beginning to shine. While his eye for goal and ability on the ball were never in doubt, what impressed most was his tactical discipline in his new position on the left. Technically, it's hard to even talk about how good he was. Tactically, though, he was very important as he faithfully carried out Zagallo's instructions for the role. That notion of tactical rigidity combined with individual flair was the secret to Brazilian success in 1970. We had Jairzinho on the right with that pace and strength and then Rivellino on the left with his ability and intelligence. Tostão then played up front. So the forward line was Jairzinho, Pelé, Tostão and Rivellino. No one could cope with that attack. We had great players, fantastic players. Even today, that national team is considered the greatest of all time. It was a team that dazzled the world. Rivellino continued to be instrumental in Brazil's World Cup campaign. He was once again on the score sheet in Brazil's 3-1 semi-final win against Uruguay. He'd gone from a bit part player to one of the world's best in just a handful of games. He was equally impressive in the final against Italy, crossing for Pelé to head the Brazilians into an early lead and towards ultimate glory. It was obviously an extremely important game. But once we got to that point, we were supremely confident and thought no one could beat us. It's not that we didn't respect Italy, but if you analyse the game, it was Brazil's easiest of the tournament. It could have been 5 or 6-1 to Brazil, but it was a game that really rewarded our team. A 4-1 win was underlined by Brazil's final goal five minutes from time, a nine-man move that embodied their teamwork and artistry. To have a final like that where we scored four goals, well, only that national team could have put on a show like that. And as captain Carlos Alberto lifted the Jules Rimet trophy aloft, Zagallo's gamble to shift Rivellino to the left wing had paid off. This idea of Zagallo's to play Rivellino on the left allowed him to get in the team, and that was great for him. And also for us, because he really helped Brazil show their best football in that World Cup. Four years later and Brazil were in West Germany in search of a fourth World Cup. But times had changed. Zagallo and Rivellino were both still there, but the magical team of 1970 was now a distant memory. The big problem in 74 was the fact that it just wasn't a good time for Brazil. A lot of players were injured or retiring. Rivellino was now back in his preferred central midfield role. With Pelé now retired, he carried the burden of being Brazil's star man. Yet the weight of the number 10 shirt seemed only to inspire him. Rivellino really helped the national team. In 1974, he had a really good tournament and Brazil did well. Indeed, he dragged his country to the final stages of the tournament after a poor start. 
Two goals from that famous left foot against East Germany and then against Argentina ensured a weakened Brazil team had a chance of retaining their title. But there was only so much Rivellino could do now that his celebrated teammates of 70 were no longer alongside him. A player like Rivellino can't win every World Cup on his own. Even Maradona didn't win every World Cup he played in. There was a shift in the balance of footballing power. Holland were now the nation revolutionising the way the game was played. A 2-0 defeat against the Dutch marked the end of over a decade of Brazilian dominance. We have to respect what Holland did. In my opinion, they were favourites to win the title because of the modern football they played in that World Cup. They just had a whole different way of seeing the game. Back home in Sao Paulo, Rivellino's troubles continued. He'd failed to win a tournament with Corinthians in his nine years there, and the club were without a title in 20 years. Their notoriously impatient fans were growing restless. He had a serious problem because it wasn't just a club with fans in Sao Paulo, but in the whole of Brazil. You get Corinthians fans everywhere. And as he was the biggest star at the club, everyone expected him to deliver a title, and he didn't manage it. In 74, Corinthians faced Palmeiras in the Sao Paulo state final. Surely the trophyless years were at an end. But Palmeiras won 1-0, and Rivellino was held to blame. Rivellino never won a title with Corinthians, and the fans blamed him for that. But he wasn't guilty of that. The whole team was to blame. He wasn't the team. You don't win anything on your own. That's when I left Corinthians and went to Rio to play for Fluminense. Rivellino made that short journey from Sao Paulo to Rio in 1974. It was a major coup for Fluminense to have signed one of the untouchables of 1970, and his impact was felt by his new teammates. I followed Rivellino in the 70 World Cup. I remember watching that team become world champions. Rivellino, just like every player who played in that 70 team, was a legend. To then play alongside him was just a dream. Rivellino also found himself reunited with another of that 1970 side. Veteran goalkeeper Felix was captain of the Rio club. I made a speech to my teammates saying that we would be welcoming a world champion with open arms. He'd never won a regional tournament. So I told them we would have to do all we could to help him win the Rio Championship. Fluminense are traditionally seen as the club of Rio's elite. Without great resources or popular support, they'd enjoyed only limited success. Rivellino brought the fans back to Fluminense that year. Just to give you an idea, his debut was on the Saturday of Carnival. It was a sacred date for all Brazilians, especially those from Rio. But the president of Fluminense was brave enough to present Rivellino to the fans on that Saturday of Carnival, and the Maracanã filled up. For Saturday during Carnival, it was impossible to have a crowd that big. It was special. It was particularly special for Rivellino too. Fluminense's opponents that day were the club who'd spurned him, Corinthians. And his response to his critics was a stunning hat-trick. I was lucky enough to score three goals, and people said I was trying to show Corinthians what they were missing. But I played the same for Fluminense. My style of football and my ability never changed. In Rio, they called Rivellino's Fluminense the Machina, the machine. The Machina was a sensational team, as it was made up of great players. In every position, there was someone who was playing for Brazil or someone who had played for Brazil in the past. It was very easy playing in a team like that. And I think it was a very easy team to coach because we played as if we were playing to music. We were practically walking when we knocked the ball around. 
Oh, those two years in Rio were fantastic. We won virtually everything. Fluminense won back-to-back -back state titles in 1975 and 76. Rivellino had finally found the winning touch at club level. He showed how good he was, as he went to Fluminense and won all the titles he could. Famous for his breathtaking skill, Rivellino also had time to perfect one trick of his own, the elastico, or flip-flap. I learned the move from a player called Sergio Ashigo, who played with me in the Corinthians youth team in 64. He invented that trick. I saw him do it once and I said, hey, Japanese, what's that trick? He said, it's easy, River, I'll teach you it. And he says now that he invented it, but I perfected it. I have to say that he was better than me at that. That was something he created. He'd always talk about it when he trained with us. It was a trait that only Rivellino could do. Everyone started doing it after him, but Rivellino did it perfectly. It was like the ball was glued to his foot. He'd do this and then the ball would come back and he'd run off with it. Really impressive. Pelé couldn't do that trick. He wasn't skillful enough. <laughs> Having starred so successfully at Fluminense, Rivellino hoped for one last shot at international glory. In 1978, he travelled to Argentina as Brazil's most experienced player, yet he was no longer the explosive force of 1970. 1978 was a World Cup that Rivellino perhaps shouldn't have even played in. But he was called up, he's a professional guy, and so he went. But it wasn't a World Cup that saw Rivellino at his best. He'd picked up an injury on his left foot only weeks before the tournament began. It was clear that Rivellino would have little impact in Argentina. Even though he wasn't playing, he still gave everyone advice, he helped out, he talked a lot. He was always ready to help out both the national team and each player individually. It was a shame as it was my last World Cup. I prepared myself well, but unfortunately picked up an injury and played only a few games. That was a World Cup I don't like to remember. Brazil struggled without his leadership, yet he still helped his country to third place. After 92 games and 26 goals, Rivellino would never again wear the yellow shirt of Brazil. A final stint playing in Saudi Arabia was followed by his retirement. Rivellino couldn't leave the game behind, however. He returned to Sao Paulo and opened his own sports centre. It's tough to retire and stop doing what you love. I love playing football. If I could, I'd still be playing. But obviously I can't do that anymore. Over in Saudi Arabia, I started to realise that the end was coming. And I'd have to stop playing and start a whole new life. His biggest influence has perhaps been the impact he made on a new generation of footballing stars. With his obvious ability and eye for invention, he struck a chord with the younger players, wanting to bring back a level of artistry to the game. I'd always watch a lot of videos of him. I'd imagine myself being Rivellino. And then I wanted to be left-footed too, like Rivellino. He was and still is one of my biggest heroes. Diego Maradona cites him as his greatest inspiration when he was growing up. The close control, feints and magical left foot were all too reminiscent of Rivellino in his prime. As he was also left-footed and very skillful, I saw myself in him. Sometimes it felt like something I'd just done, but in fact it was Maradona. There were certain similarities in certain situations, but it's satisfying for me that he admired my football and liked me. Life has come full circle for Rivellino. Back in his childhood neighbourhood, he's keeping the flame burning for the next generation of talent. With buildings taking the place of the open streets in which he learned his trade, he's giving young players a chance to flourish in Sao Paulo's concrete jungle. 40 years on from that triumph in Mexico, Roberto Rivellino's star is still shining brightly.
Calhou de dar do espaço você, infelizmente. Aqui. They've got rid of all the open spaces where kids used to play football. There's nowhere left. It's just buildings. At least here I've got a space for kids to play and learn a bit. And it's fun. Football is in my blood, and it's nice to see the kids messing around on the pitch during the classes. I like that. I like that a lot.